Thank you all for being here. It's a real pleasure to have you here on the topic on of food waste because it's really important uh, matters. Um, so, uh, how we were planning the event to happen would be to be divided in two parts. But regarding that, we are already like in a in a small committee. Uh, a committee, we can already uh, mix up the, the these two parts into a one main event where the idea is to. First of all, get to know each other because we and you especially are working on uh, sort of food wastes uh, topics which are having like a tremendous impact on the environment, but also have some uh, really important factors as a social uh, with social consequences. Um, so to briefly just introduce myself, so um, I'm Thomas, I'm a co-founder of Climate Connect, which is a non-profit organization uh, where we aim to connect all uh, the climate actors in the world because uh, we believe that we almost have all the solutions we need to fight the climate crisis, but we just need to uh, get to know all of them and spread the word about them, help each other and replicate them because it's only by acting collectively that we will be able to uh, to make a significant, a significant change. Um, so in that spirit, we've uh, created uh, Climate Connect, uh, the web platform on which I think you all uh, has been registered. You can create so your uh, profile and then indicates uh, your needs to some, uh, some indications about, about your projects. So the idea that we had, we had behind was to create a community of all uh, climate actors in the world and so they can help each other and replicate projects um, because, yeah, as we just said, it's only by acting collectively that things, things will change. Um, in parallel, like today, we are animating some uh, online events. Um, so last one we had was about sustainable universities and today's one is about so food waste. Uh, so we will uh, let give you the word afterwards so you can uh, present a bit your, your organization and the great solutions you all have. Um, before that, so the event will then for about yeah, an hour. Um, we were first planning to have some, yeah, a global presentation from your for from yourself and so to give some yeah, bit speech about what you're doing why you're doing it etc um, and then go to more like some interactive um, interactive events and try to uh, see how we could help each other and elaborate some uh, strategies to uh, to fight food wastes um, yeah, uh, I assume that I don't really have to specify that, but uh, it's um, this event is to help each other. So please always be respectful to yourself and to the other. Respect the uh, the, uh, the the when other people are taking the, the the words. And yeah, I hope you you will enjoy this event as as much as I will do. Um, so maybe to start, I will let the word to uh, Regina from SNP because she's going to give you a small introduction uh, about food wastes um, and she will uh, let us know more about it. Okay, um, thank you, Toma. Um, right, uh, I'm Regina, as he said, I work for the student organization SNP. And we are not only concerned with food waste, but once we did a project, um, so I was asked to share some facts on food waste and I would need um, the permission to share my screen, please. <laughs> I don't know who's the host. Uh, Toby. Um, yeah, because uh, then we will have a really, really small introduction and I will um, afterwards present what we did. Um, so can you see my screen? Yes, okay, great. Um, so I will leave it like that and I hope the connection is stable. Um, yeah. So why should we care about food waste? I think uh, we probably all know that because we are in this call, but just to sum it up and to have some facts in mind um, during this uh, call, um, because food waste actually um, contributes a lot to the global greenhouse gas emissions 
um, this chart here from our world in data shows that uh, food production is responsible for almost one fourth of um, global greenhouse gas emissions. Um, obviously, we need to eat food, but the sad thing is that actually 6% of these global greenhouse gas emissions are then either thrown away in the households, which is this part, or lost somewhere in the supply chain. Um, and I've got two more charts here. This one is especially for Europe. Um, I think many people have in mind that um, all the food waste happens somewhere, let's say, in the production. And this is partly right, because we can see a big share is uh, indeed lost in the production, or this accounts for overproduction, or also byproducts, like, for example, bones that are then thrown away. But on the other hand, individuals do matter because we have 42% um, of food wasted in the households. I think this is from 2010, so maybe it has changed a bit, but still it's a big share. And then 14% um, in the gastronomy, so when portions are too big or they miscalculated the demand, and then the wholesale or retail um, when there are some mistakes in packaging or something like that. And then this is unfortunately for Germany, but I guess, um, I don't know if it looks probably the same in other European countries at least, is that a major part that is thrown away are fruits and vegetables, um, maybe because they are not um, stored the right way and then spoil. Um, then instant meals and leftovers are another, another big share, bread and baked goods. And what I found find really sad is that Dairy products and fish and meat um, also uh, are a big percent or are some percentage of what is th thrown away. And as we all know, these produce uh, very much greenhouse gases when uh, during production. So that is really um, sad. Yeah, and that's already the interjection I wanted to make uh, some facts. And as I unfortunately have to leave, I would now right away go to the project read it. Is that okay, Toma? Toby? Okay. So um, our project was rather small, but I think it was great fun because actually Tobias uh, built a so-called, or what we call it, smoothie bike. Um, so I had a broken mixer and he had a bike where he put this construction. I don't know how it works exactly, but um, the idea is that we had another organization which is um, called, wait, now I'm confused, uh, food sharing. Yeah, it's a German organization, or at least we know it from Germany, and they gave us, um, yeah, fruits and vegetables from supermarkets that would other otherwise have been um, thrown away, and we had people just um, slice them into parts and put them into the mixer, and then they could um, go onto the bicycle and cycle to produce their own smoothie, and I think uh, and here in the background, you can see that we put up the information and facts on food waste. And I really like the project and also the people who participated because it's an easy way uh, and a fun way to make people aware of food waste and also talk with, uh, with them about the facts. Okay, that's it from my part. Thank you very much. Perfect, thank you, Regina. Um, Tessa, would you like to uh, carry on and briefly present uh, us your organization? Yeah, sure. Hi, everybody. I'm Tessa. I am co-founder and CEO of Olio. Olio is an app that exists to tackle the problem of food waste, uh, specifically in the home. So you've seen in those charts there, uh, it varies from country to country, but generally food waste in the home is somewhere between 40 and 50 percent of all food waste. And we do that by connecting people with their neighbors so you can give away your spare food rather than throw it away. So how it works is you snap a photo of whatever item you have that you don't want, you add it to the app, neighbors living nearby get an alert, they can browse the listings, request what they want and pop around and pick it up. We've had two and a half million people join Olio so far. Together they have shared eight million portions of food and the environmental impact of that is equivalent to taking 20 million car miles off the road. And we've also saved over a billion liters of water. We have, um, I guess there's two things that you won't necessarily figure out just through looking at the app itself. 
The first is just how strong the demand for the food is. So half of all the food added to the app is requested within 24 minutes. So a lot of people wonder who on earth would want my head of broccoli? Who on earth would want my two lemons? The answer is there is no shortage of people who want your spare food. You've just got to take that leap of faith uh, and add it to the app and make it available to neighbors. The other aspect of what, I'm sorry, and the second thing you won't figure out just by looking at the app is just how strong the community is. So whilst Olio looks like an app, in reality, it's about connecting people in real life. In a sort of a COVID environment, um, all of the pickups are sort of no contact pickups, um, but still taking place uh, on the doorstep. And the Olio community is incredibly strong. And that's what our, our users sort of join Olio because they hate food waste and they stay because they feel connected to their local community, they feel safer because they know who their neighbors are and they feel empowered in the face of the impending climate crisis. They feel like they're doing something to make a difference. The other thing um, that Olio does is we have our Food Waste Heroes program. And essentially what we do is we recruit volunteers via the app. We train them online on our proprietary food safety management system and we match them to their local business, which could be a supermarket or a cafe or a bakery or a corporate canteen. We put those volunteers on an in-app chat around a particular store location. So there's a squad of volunteers who support a store. And those volunteers on their allotted time and day pop out of their homes across the road. They pick up all of the unsold food from that business. They take it home, they add it to the app. Within minutes, their neighbors are requesting it. Minutes later, the neighbors are popping around and picking up that food. So that takes that food from being a waste stream in a store to instead within one or two hours later being fully redistributed into the homes of the local community. And we're working with a number of retailers, uh, the largest of which is Tesco, which is the UK's largest supermarket. We're busy rolling out across their whole store portfolio. We're also working with businesses such as pret manger Costa Coffee, Compass Catering, Eurostar, etc. And I think that's probably enough from me for now. All right, thank you, thank you a lot. Um, Sebastian from oh, there's, Sorry, there's already a question in the chat. Oh, uh, okay, so yeah, yeah. Okay. So you can answer that. Yep, um, so are there any legal issues? So I mentioned we have a proprietary food safety management system. So we've been working with our uh, food safety lawyer and also our environmental health officer who represents our designated sort of primary authority or government body. We've also been working with the FSA and the key thing is to ensure that that food is safely collected, stored and redistributed and so we have all the systems and processes, checks and balances in place to ensure that our volunteers are properly trained and are redistributing the food correctly. Um, we often find when we first started out, it was a common objection. I think for many years, the reason why the problem of food waste at a store level has not been addressed is because the stores didn't really want to deal with the problem. They said, oh, you know, health and safety, we might get sued. And everyone went, oh, yeah, OK, and backed down. Now, the reality is that almost every type of food can be safely collected and redistributed. You just need to work through the details as to how to do that. And we've spent three years doing that and we now have an incredibly scalable system um, that enables us to safely collect and redistribute food from a whole variety of businesses including hot food um, and chilled food and frozen food the other thing actually sorry i didn't say is that three quarters of olio's activity is taking place in the uk but a quarter of our weekly uh, sharing is taking place overseas and our most active markets are mexico singapore new zealand um, and then the channel islands of Guernsey and Jersey have gone crazy for Olio as well. So we're really busy there. Uh, and we have smaller communities in, in places like Stockholm, for example, too. All right, uh, does someone else have some questions or maybe you can just type them on the, on the chats and we will get back to, back to them later. Um, Sebastian, if you want to carry on. So hi, hello, I have to share my screen. Um, if you can, yes. uh, yep, Toby, can you give him the rights to share his screen? That should work now. Yes. Okay. Okay. 
so the solution is a little bit different um, uh, currently, if everybody can see that. Well, um, so I am the CEO and the founder of a company named Frigo Magic. We are based in France. Uh, we have a version in English named Magic Free. Um, and the idea of this uh, app is uh, to, uh, to respond to the, to, the, to the daily question, what's for dinner? In fact, um, um, many, many people are, don't know how to, um, how to uh, um, cook their, uh, their meal. And, uh, and, and sometimes they need some more idea or, or, or ask for, I have just a little uh, thing left in my fridge or left in my cupboard. And the idea of Frigo Magic is to help them to find a, a meal, a good meal, uh, to, to, um, to avoid uh, waste, food waste. So how it works, when people download the app, they say what they have uh, always, sometimes or never in the free, because we are all the same, we are always doing the same um, shopping. So we show, show the same food from week to week, and uh, uh, often we will also cook the same food. So the idea is the first time it's already set up and, and, and that you can uh, uh, put for, because you don't like, for, for instance, camembert, you don't like French cheese, for instance, uh, or, or you like butter and so on. And when you uh, come at home, uh, if you want to, to have some bread that left, and, but you don't want to, to, to just eat bread with, the, with the, some butter on inside, you, you click on, you touch the, uh, the bread and we propose um, receipt based on what you have. So it's very easy to find recipe uh, even if you don't know how to cook. And then when you go to the recipe, you have a second chance um, and uh, you, you, can, you, you can find some, if you have, for instance, no milk, but you have some soy, soya milk, you can, if you cook, uh, um, commit that, you can change the, the recipe uh, to, to be able to, to do it with uh, soy milk. So um, we are in France. We are, um, uh, so we are mainly used in France, and it's mainly used by a woman uh, around uh, 30, 30, 30, 30, 35 years old, and she is uh, urban, living in Paris or big company, a big, big city in France, also all around the world. And today, five years later, we have around one the Million user. Um, everywhere in the world, like you can see, at the beginning it was uh, many in France and the French speaking um, country. But uh, when we launched in 2019 um, in English, we, uh, we, we are used in the US. So, for instance, during the COVID, the COVID part, the COVID lockdown here in France, we, uh, the poll here in France, uh, did around Two million meals during the three month uh, lockdown, and it's it's completely um, that all. And uh, we are only um, a mobile app. We are just working inside the the house. And uh, currently, we would like to, to to do more and to be able to for our uh, um, user to change ID, change recipe, or, or stuff in the, in the few uh, later months. So that's all. Oops, sorry. Okay, nice. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Okay, uh, yeah, there's so one question from Chris, which is like, are recipes submitted by users? No, no. Uh, in fact, uh, we can um, uh, get the recipe from user, but we, we need the cook to, uh, to put in the app because you are, we are, you are able to change the ingredient. It's not an algorithm. It's really based on, on the cooking. So you can't, uh, can't exchange uh, any ingredient by another. We have to, 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 to do some trial and, and so on. Okay, yes, yeah, so certain uh, recipes need to, to, yeah. to, yeah, to fulfill certain restrictions. Yeah. Okay, right, right. Exactly. Um, so Francisco is not here yet. Um, maybe, uh, Rochelle, if you want to uh, carry on and introduce yourself. 
Sure. Yeah. Thank you for having me. I joined a little bit late. We had daylight savings here and I forgot to update my uh, calendar invite apparently. Um, but yeah, I'm sorry I missed a couple of the first presentations, but I'm really happy to be here with you all. Um, so I am Rochelle. I'm the membership manager with Upcycled Food Association and really excited to tell you a little bit more about the work that we're doing. Um, so Upcycled Food Association is a nonprofit trade association with the mission of reducing food waste by growing the upcycled food economy. So we were founded just over a year ago in October of 2019 by upcycled food companies themselves who recognized the power of collaboration in growing a successful and revolutionary new food category, as well as an environmental movement. And so in just one year, we've grown to over 120 members in 20 countries from startups to publicly traded companies such as Dole and Barry Calabout. And I'll go ahead and start by defining upcycled food for any of you that aren't familiar with the term. Earlier this year, we were actually able to work with Harvard University, World Wildlife Fund, National Resources Defense Council, Drexel University, and other experts to create an official definition of upcycled food. And that is upcycled foods use ingredients that otherwise would have not gone to human consumption. Um, they are procured and produced using verifiable supply chains and have a positive impact on the environment. So what does this actually mean? This basically means that your so-called ugly fruits and vegetables, byproducts such as spent grain from brewing beer, and other underutilized ingredients normally viewed as waste, such as 70% of the cacao fruit that goes to waste during the chocolate making process, it means taking these delicious and very nutritious ingredients and rethinking them being called waste and incorporating them into new products. So giving them a second life and basically creating a more circular economy in our food system. So a couple of the examples of things that our own members are doing, like I said, we have 120 members working on creating different products. Um, so for example, something a lot of you are probably familiar with is turning surplus bread into beer, such as toast ale, um, taking okara, which is a byproduct of the soy milk process and turning it into a gluten-free flour. Um, taking juice pulp from the juicing process, turning it into snackable chips, and the list goes on and on and on, and the opportunities are really endless. So it's really exciting to be surrounded by so many companies that are taking these ingredients that you don't really think twice about um, and turning them into really delicious products. So while our members are the ones actually doing the work, creating the products and the ingredients, our job at UFA is doing all the behind the scenes work to grow the environment of upcycle businesses and make it habitable and grow this, this movement as a whole. So this means that we're working on consumer education campaigns such as defining upcycled food like I mentioned before, bringing together different researchers to increase industry knowledge, um, getting more financial capital into the upcycled food space and industry, and even launching a product certification program um, next year actually so that all of our upcycled brands can start to show the impact on their products. So just like you see organic, fair trade, non-GMO on products today, next thing you'll be seeing next year is upcycled products. Um, and this will also help, you know, not only show impact of what the products are doing by reducing food waste, but also consumers can start finding these products in store. Just like today, you can go to store and you can find everything organic, baby food, a hairbrush, food. Um, we're hoping that you can do the same thing with upcycled food in the future. Um, so yeah, we know there's a ton of potential in the upcycled food industry. Um, FMI estimated that the industry is worth about $47 billion with a 5% annual growth, um, growth rate, annual compound growth rate. Um, and all of this research was done before UFA even existed. So we're, we're thinking that with us here doing these resources, um, bringing together this network, there's really only, only um, the opportunity to go up from here. Um, so we're really excited and I'll go ahead and pause there um, if there's any questions and we can obviously dig into more of the details later. But thank you for having us here. So excited. Yeah, thank you for your presentation. Um, yeah, I'm having like a small questions. Um, how do you generally uh, like find a new recipe basically because like you take you start from with the waste like you say you identify um, an industry that's really some waste and then try to think about how to use uh, those waste to transform it to other resources or the other way one like for example we would like to find a new way to to do some beer and then you manage to uh, think like uh, bread can uh, can help you with 
Yeah, no, that's a great question. I think it's a, a little bit of both, right? And um, like I said, our, so we're in a trade association. So our members are the ones actually making these products. So they're probably the experts on this of how they're, you know, figuring out the waste streams. But, you know, some of them are obvious, right? You see ugly fruits and vegetables. That's a big topic that people talk about. Why, you know, why aren't these sold at retailers, even though they're perfectly delicious? Um, so we know some people are looking at waste streams that are more obvious like that, more hot topics and figuring out ways to, you know, put them into their products. A lot of them, I think a lot of the talk that we have is about byproducts. So these manufacturers of products, like, for example, people in the juicing industry, they see in their process that they're creating these delicious juices, but they always have some sort of waste stream, right? And this happens in the brewing process and, and juicing and all sorts of industries. And so they're starting to think, okay, we have this waste stream that we're putting money into and losing money by just tossing it. Can we do something with this? So I think a lot of the innovation is coming just by looking internally at their processes of, okay, we're creating this product and we have this waste stream. I'm sure it's edible. I'm sure it's nutritious. It can be delicious. Um, so it's a lot of people really looking at, I think, their current processes and just coming up with new ways to incorporate that waste stream or former waste stream into something new. Um, so a lot of it is actually coming from like the manufacturing byproduct um, sort of area, if that makes sense. All right, thank you. Um, now, uh, Jean-Claude, do you we, want to... Uh, got another question in the chat. Oh, sorry. <laughs> so uh, how's the price range on those products that were upcycled? So is it, way, is it a little bit cheaper than normal, like normal products or how's the price of that? Yeah, so I mean, it really depends on the products, right? So we have products from, you know, it kind of depends are you offering a premium product? What category are you in? Um, I will say we there's some research recently done, and I can share it in the chat in a minute um, once I look for it, but we actually had some research done by Drexel University um, talking about consumers' willingness to pay for upcycled foods. And when you see upcycled foods, what is your perception of that? Um, and what we saw was when they were educated about the concept of upcycled foods, which a lot of people right now hear upcycled foods and they think, oh, it came from the dumpster, it came from, you know, something's wrong with it. And so that's part of our consumer education campaign is making sure they know it's not the case. Um, but once they're educated about what upcycled foods are, they're willing to put a, pr a higher price point on those products. Um, so while I can't speak to what the price range is right now, just because it really varies across the products and the brands and where they lie, um, I do think consumers' willingness to pay for it is higher because they see it as, you know, having an added benefit to the environment, having a sustainable backbone, things along those lines. Great question, though. All right. Okay. Uh, no one's from Fabian. Um, it's a, how do you identify actors who create upcycled products and are investors willing already to invest in this industry? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so, you know, so far in our first year, a lot of the growth has truly been pretty organic. We haven't had to go out and look too hard for uh, upcycled food brands and products. People are hearing about us and, and kind of saying, oh, we want to be involved in defining where this movement goes. So, so far it's been pretty easy, honestly. And what we realized, we actually did a um, survey of our current membership that showed there are already at least 400 plus upcycled products out there. Um, so we know we're not having to scramble to find those. And those are just the ones we, we know about because of our network, right? So we've been pretty lucky in that there's just a really wide range of brands who even aren't, maybe aren't doing it right now, but they're curious about it. You know, these big CPG companies that they know they want to make money and get value out of their waste streams as well. So it's even just people that are curious about it. But that's part of the conversation I'd love to have with you all is, you know, we're based in the US. Yes, we have 20 different countries, but I know there's so much expansion we can do there globally and, and hacking into y'all's networks and, and hearing more about that. Um, in terms of investors, that is a, we do have a good number of investors investing in our current member companies, um, but that is a strategy that we're working on going forward, like I mentioned, is bringing more financial capital into the space and educating investors about the value of upcycled food companies. So we're expecting in the coming year to have that really grow significantly as well and even have them partner with our organization. Okay, perfect. Um, Jean-Claude, would you like to add the word? 
Uh, oui, bonjour. Hello, everybody. I'm from Paris. Um, Jean-Claude, I am the co-founder and treasurer of the association, association, uh, non-profit association, Up Up Food, which was uh, created four years ago in Paris by Parisians. So it's a citizen project at the beginning. And we have created this project in order, I am a, a volunteer, I'm not paid by the association. Uh, in, in my real life, I am a civil servant from the Ministry of Finance in Paris. And uh, so we have created uh, Up Up Food in order to give to citizens and now uh, trades um, uh, means and tools in order to lower and to, um, uh, to treat their uh, food waste. So at the beginning, we have uh, two years ago, we have uh, implemented in France a digital platform. So it's an app, uh, but also it's uh, working on internet and on, on the PC. So it's a, it's a digital platform. Uh, where uh, citizens can, um, individuals can uh, give food to other uh, citizens. So the purpose of Up Up Food is to uh, help people in need uh, and um, trying to, what we are trying to do is every time to do things for free for people in need and uh, people in food insecurity, in French we say precarité alimentaire, it, it is exploding in France. Uh, now 18 uh, million people in France have less than three euro per day and per person to, to feed themselves. So it's, it's growing, unfortunately not only in France, but in Europe. And so our um, initiatives always are to help people in need and not especially, uh, not only to uh, address food waste. So it's to address food waste and in the same time, make sure that this food, which is not wasted, go to people in need and not people which can pay for the food. So this is why first we, we did that through an app. Um, and in our app, uh, when people are putting some food, it takes in Paris eight seconds between the moment people put the food and people take the food, eight seconds. Um, and in the suburb of Paris, it takes between 23 and 30 seconds. Um, then we have created a network in France held by the government, the French government, ADEM, which is the agency in France, uh, which is uh, taking care of food waste. Uh, so we are held by the state, but also the région Ile-de-France, the region, Paris region, it is called Ile de France, uh, and we are implementing a network of pantries. Um, so it's uh, recycled wood uh, cupboards. Uh, so it's not digital for this for this initiative. Um, in order for people to make sure that they have in their area where they live or where they work uh, a tool, a uh, concrete tool where they can put food, uh, then which is not wasted. And this food can be collected by people in need. And this is not fridge. It is not electrified. This is why it's a, it's a pantry. In French, we say garde de manger. So it's not an, uh, an, a fridge. And it's not outside. It's always inside um, uh, partners, uh, which are sometimes associations, sometimes uh, uh, also trades, etc. The third initiative we had, we began this third initiative uh, in May, last May, is we have created, of course, every one of you, you know, Too Good To Go, of course. We have created a solidarity Too Good To Go in France. So you know exactly what is Too Good To Go. I just have to tell you the difference between Too Good To Go and us in France. Uh, well, first we are French, Too Good To Go is not, is Danish. Uh, first, secondly, we are uh, social economy. Uh, too Good To Go has been created to make money. Uh, thirdly, uh, for Too Good To Go, the food is not free. It is one third of the price. For us, in our platform, the food is free, completely free from the trades. And, uh, but it is reserved, it is only for people in need, which have a sort of stamp by the government or by the, the local authorities, to say that these people are in need and they have then they receive a code 
uh, and they can use in our app uh, this code in order to see what are the uh, trades. Uh, so nowadays we are in Paris and suburb of Paris and also Toulouse region. We have 250 trades. We have supermarkets like Carrefour, Auchan, Monoprix, Franprix, but also local um, trades. Uh, we have butchers, we have uh, boulangerie, we have uh, uh, so bakeries, sorry, uh, etc. And um, the difference is that uh, with our system, because of what we call in French defiscalisation, tax refund from the government, because we are a non-profit and recognize of uh, uh, general interest, the, the trades who, which are uh, giving the food through our app and not too good to go, for example, or Karma or Phoenix, they receive, the, the trade receive three times the money they receive from Too Good To Go or from Karma, because the detax is 60% from the government. So it means for us, the promise we do to the trades is very simple. With us, you give, money, you give food which would be wasted, you don't waste food, and you give that to people in need and not your former customer. And you will receive with us three times the money you receive with the, 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 the platform like Too Good To Go or Karma or, or Phoenix. And it's, it's uh, growing. We, we have a big success already in Paris and Paris region. And we are very uh, close to sign an agreement with the Carrefour uh, company and also Auchan company and Monoprix company. Maybe you don't know Monoprix, but it's a big company. Uh, it's a subsidiary of a casino, group casino. And, uh, and that's it. So this is what we do. We are trying to develop the, the, the food which is going to people in need. Uh, all right, awesome. Um, what uh, I can offer you right now, maybe, uh, and uh, it's just to wait for a moment uh, about like a professional stuff and try to talk a bit about a bit more about like us personally. So maybe what we can do is for everyone to uh, briefly uh, introduce himself more like on a personal level within two, like two, one or two sentences, say what are your hobbies, what are your tastes, what do you like to do in your daily life? So we can yeah, just pose a bit the professional side and just yeah, try to connect some more um, personal uh, relation if that's fine for you. Um, maybe we could start with like by order in my screen. So I will start with the up left, which is uh, Julius. If you want to have also a small introduction of yourself and yeah, to let us know about you. Okay, hi everybody. Um, very exciting to meet you all. I'm I'm Julius. I'm also working at Climate Connect as a volunteer. Um, what are my hobbies? Climate Connect, <laughs> um, and I'm living in Augsburg. It's next to Erlangen, where Climate Connect was found. And yeah, I'm very excited to meet you. And I hope that we will get some nice connections over here. And um, a quick question to you all. Is it OK if I make some pictures during the call? For afterwards, I can post it on Instagram, and I can attach you, and then reconnect via Instagram. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, yeah, Toby, would you carry on? Uh, sure. I, um, I'm also one of the co-founders of Climate Connect and in my free time when I'm not working, um, I like to do some sports. I'm doing triathlon. I also like to do uh, woodworking and uh, of course playing with my little one-year-old son. <laughs> it's always fun. And it also takes a lot of time. Yeah. <laughs> um, Sebastian, would you like to carry on? Yes, sorry. Yeah, Sebastian, so I am um, a software engineer. Um, so I like to program. In fact, uh, each time I can, I program many things, many stuff uh, like IoT or my, 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 my children are old, so uh, I, I have a lot of time <laughs> to do that. Uh, 
That's all. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Tessa, who would like to carry on? Hey, everybody. Um, hobbies. Uh, Olio <laughs> takes up pretty much most of my time. I've got two young kids, um, a little girl who is six and a little boy who is eight next Wednesday. And we've been counting that down for several weeks. Um, I like to, I live in a village, so uh, sort of right by the countryside. So I like to cycle and run every day. Um, yeah, that's pretty. And I do a lot of baking and cooking, batch cooking, especially now that we're in lockdown here in the UK. And uh, yeah, that's me. Awesome. Uh, Rochelle, would you like to carry on too? Sure. Uh, nice to meet everybody. So I am Rochelle and I live in Georgia, down in the, the southern part of the U.S. Um, I do feel like my hobbies have changed a bit since uh, quarantine and what I'm actually able to do, but generally speaking, I love hiking and traveling. I've gotten a little bit into um, having a little home garden here, so that's been nice to get my green thumb. And then I've been taking on a lot of fermentation projects, so I love being in the kitchen and experimenting with food, so it keeps me busy. Nice. Chris? Hi, I'm Chris. Um, I'm also one of the co-founders of Climate Connect. Um, I spend most of my time on Climate Connect, but I really like, really like doing sports. I like playing tennis. I'm really happy that playing tennis is allowed still. It was about to be cancelled in Germany and now it's allowed if you play with just one person. Um, yeah, and other than that, I just hang out with my roommates, with my girlfriend, and yeah, that's it. It's yeah, hey guys. Uh, I'm living in Nuremberg, which is next to Erlang. In my free time, I work on Climate Connect as well. Apart from that, I'm writing my master thesis at the moment. Um, and in my free time, I love to hang out with my flatmates as well and do sports like running and also playing tennis. Yeah. And I'm very excited to meet you all. Hi. Mm -hmm. Uh, Jean-Claude? Uh, I don't have a lot of hobbies, but uh, well, I, I like to, uh, to take my bicycle and to go around the, the Paris region. Um, and I don't, like a, I don't have a lot of hobbies because also I have many life uh, in my ministry uh, in Hope of Food. And also I am teaching at uh, Paris Assas, uh, Paris 2, Paris 2. Uh, one of uh, the university in Paris. I'm uh, teaching social economy and social entrepreneurship. Um, voilà. Nice, very cool. <laughs> Irene? Hi everybody, sorry my camera is not working. Uh, I live in Groningen in the Netherlands and I work uh, at the sustainable department of my university. Uh, one of my hobby uh, hobbies is cooking. That's why I find this uh, topic very interesting of uh, food waste. Um, and yeah, nice to meet you all. All right, perfect. Uh, so I think everyone talked. Um, so I was uh, planning in the first time to do some yeah, interactive game, but I think we are already like in smaller group and already get to know us, each other. So maybe <clears throat> if it's fine for you, um, we, we could go a bit more uh, concretely on the topic on what would be um, the collaboration opportunities or what would be the expectation from the such event because one of the... Um, objective we had through such type of, uh, of uh, interaction is try to create some community that will help yeah, that we help each other so if um, if, you, if you would like um, maybe each of you can go quickly about one specific problematic that they are facing right now and if they think some of us because uh, like you already know what the other people are doing if one of us could help you with this problematic if you need just to be put it into relation with other people um it, it depends quite a lot uh, but um i think it could be a good also opportunity to for now today just to see what would be the trends and if it will make sense to organize other events where we can quickly work on a specific topic 
that could be like how to uh, convince uh, some restaurants or some groceries to uh, to uh, do some food waste actions or how to uh, encourage um, people to uh, locally like individually um, store their, their, their food waste or to give them through uh, to to other uh, through an app or to other applica uh, application so um if you if you would like to to do that maybe we can go again just like one by one um through through this topic um so for example sebastian what are the um, the current problematics that you you are facing and you what what how could we each uh, of us here could uh, help you with Uh, each time I have some problem to put on the, the microphone. Yeah, um, uh, currently we are we are mainly focused on on the on, on France and French people. Mm -hmm. um, we have some use in the English speaking country, but uh, everywhere else, um, um, we, we, some people are using or app in in French and English to. Uh, but uh, I think that in the following months or year, we would like to, to go to some new uh, country like Spain or Italian or especially Spanish, because uh, there are a lot of people are, 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 are speaking Spanish. Uh, one other thing we are working on currently, we are working on, on food waste. So it was or, uh, at, the, at, the end, uh, at the end, uh, at the beginning. But um, we introduce um, uh, in the app uh, something that is very French, but used in Europe, uh, or, uh, at, which, which is the name uh, Nutri-Score. Um, Nutri-Score is, it's, is pushed by the French government to be used everywhere in Europe. You, you, you can see in on the package. So we, we are currently calculating the Nutri-Score for the recipe we, we propose. In the following weeks, we will be able also to calculate a NECO score. So uh, the impact of using um, an ingredient uh, instead of uh, another uh, on the planet. For instance, if you are using a recipe with uh, meat, the impact will be uh, much more uh, significant in, in terms of climate um, 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 problematic. So uh, I think we will launch that it was uh, previously uh, uh, planned for the, the for the 15th of November, but um, we are not alone. We have with some other um, 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 application here in France, based in France, and we work also with the ADEM. Uh, I think uh, Jean Claude talked about the ADEM, so it's uh, just a, a French. Um, uh, organization, a government organization. So yes, um, this kind of, of of things, we would like that um, the, the news score is open open source. The ECO score will be open. So if people outside France or outside Europe are be able to to push that, it could be a good idea um, for the for, for 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 the stuff we we need in the following years. Because, uh, like Rochelle, you were also saying that you were um, also trying to put some numbers behind, uh, like the fight to save food and to reuse the different wastes, right? Yeah, we're so in our certification program. I think a lot of data is going to come from that as we collect data from, you know, the manufacturers and the producers that are, you know, certifying their products. They'll be telling us, okay, how many tons are you diverting from you know landfills eventually we would like to go into greenhouse gas metrics as well um, so those are things that are going to start to be collected more over time yeah and yeah for the methodology like uh, why you uh, after you're going to have like all of those numbers would you uh, like you are also going to create like a yeah, specific methodology to analyze and to produce numbers into relation with uh, like the the overall score right yeah, I think so. And, and a lot of this too, um, and I can talk about this more in a bit, our certification is very much in the, the draft form right now. So these are the questions that we're asking ourselves as well as, you know, once we get this data, what does it look like from there on out? How do we share it? What's the methodology going forward for collecting it? Um, so yeah, so these are all the questions we're, in, we're asking ourselves right now as well. But 
Um, our whole goal with the certification is to make it a very impact based certification where when you look at it on a product, you know how much food that, you know, that granola bar made from spent grain, you know how much they diverted from a landfill or how much, you know, their greenhouse gas metric is. So that's something we're, we're focusing on going forward, but definitely still in the, the early stages of figuring out the logistics around it. Mm -hmm. But I do know there's also, um, I don't know if you've heard of Refed, many of you, um, but they're a large organization. I can link them in here if you haven't. And I know something they're working on right now is there, I believe it's called the Insights Engine. And this is going to be focused on different solutions to feed food waste um, and, and having a lot more information around data points around that and, and collecting data. And so that's definitely something I don't think it's fully launched yet. I think they're in the stages of building that up, but that's something to, I think, keep an eye on as well. And what about you, Tessa? Are you also trying like, to put some uh, numbers, and etc., or do you have like such a similar methodology? We calculate our impact through doing sampling analysis um, to look at the weight and the value of the food that's shared by the platform, and then we use government data about the typical CO2 emissions for a typical kilogram of food waste. We also know the amount of water that goes into producing a typical kilogram of food waste. And then there are all sorts of conversion metrics to convert a ton of CO2 emissions, for example, into car miles or trees planted or, or light bulbs, etc. So that's how we measure our impact. But maybe you will also be interested if uh, the result, like the methodology they um, <clears throat> they have, is open source. It might also maybe help you with with that to do, doesn't it? Um, much. Well, what we've got works really well right now, so we don't have any uh, requirements. Okay. What we will need when we expand internationally is to know what the typical CO two emissions are for a typical kilogram of food waste in. Mexico or Singapore or New Zealand or France because obviously the sort of composition of the food that's being wasted and the carbon footprint is different country to country but right now that's not a top area of focus for us. And, and you Jean-Claude do you also have like similar uh, methodology or try to put some numbers behind that? Um, um, for us uh, the methodologies are uh, uh, different. We have, of course, uh, we follow, uh, of course, the agency ADEM for uh, calculation of uh, food waste, which has been not wasted through our um, uh, services, etc. So, uh, as was said by Sebastian, uh, uh, ADEM is uh, the state agency, so we follow carefully. Uh, uh, and I am myself a civil servant from the state, so uh, we follow very carefully what the state is saying and what the state is doing because we follow that. Um, but we have also methodology for us for uh, people in need uh, to calculate the, uh, uh, the how much money they have at the end of the day to uh, to to say that this that this person can access to the free food through our trades or not. So for this, we, we have in France several methodologies. Uh, one is from the uh, Red Cross, one is from uh, uh, the Secours Caritas, uh, one is from Secours Populaire, uh, and we follow the, the methodology of Secours Populaire in France for that. So uh, you understand because we are at the same time on food waste and on food uh, precarity, insecurity, we have different kind of metrics to follow. And, um, but we, we do that uh, pretty well, I think. And uh, pretty well because it is available online uh, on, uh, on the French uh, websites of these uh, uh, structures of these organizations, state or non-state organization. Sorry, sorry to interrupt, um, but I'm afraid I, I've got to leave now. Um, because I've got an, another engagement to go to. Um, so I was only able to stay for an hour. So it was lovely meeting everybody. Um, I'll Thank just you. pop my email. Well, actually, you should, you've got my email address um, from the email. But if anyone wants to reach out, then please don't hesitate to get in touch. I'm very happy to help in any way that we can. 
And yeah, just after the event, we're going to create like on Climate Connect, we implement the message, the messages. So we were thinking about create like a group message with everyone here. And so if we want to share, ask some other questions, share some other links, etc., you we will have all these group chat all together. So it will be easier to, to reach out to them than just sending emails, etc. It's always sometimes, sometimes quite complicated. Okay, great. So we'll invite you all. Thank you very much. Keep fighting the good fight, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you a lot for yeah. your participation. Bye. Good yes. luck with your project. Uh, um, yeah, so do you have some more time? Because it's already uh, one hour, but if we haven't go through everyone, so maybe uh, if we, we could carry on if it's fine for you. Um, all right, perfect. Uh, so maybe Rochelle, if you want to yeah, explain us what were you, if you have any ex specific expectation from attending to uh, this event, if you would like to be helped with something, yeah, if there is there anything we can do uh, for you now? Yeah, I think, you know, a lot of sort of what I mentioned before um, and something that kind of touches on a few of the projects that we're working on is growing awareness of upcycled food growing membership and all these things internationally so we do have like i said we have representation from you know 20 different countries and it's growing all the time but we're definitely mostly focused on our membership bases us and canada and we'd like to expand that um, and i know next year that's a big um, priority of mine as well because upcycling food and food waste isn't just a us centric thing it's a global issue right and so we want to be able to expand that as much as possible so you know, I think this touches on a few things. I, I think one thing that would be really helpful right now from everyone, um, not necessarily on this call, but I can send out this information is we are launching our certification program in um, early next year is the plan. So right now we've had a team of experts working for months on developing a standard essentially that the certification will be measured against and that products will, you know, these are the guidelines to get your product certified. And right now we have the draft standard actually posted on our website for a public comment period to get feedback from um, folks around the world. And I think it would be really, really helpful whether it's you're the best person to give that feedback and look at it if you're curious or if you know of other people um, that work in this space, just directing them to that so we can get um, feedback on that. I think it would be really, really helpful because I do think our first iteration of the certification will likely be for US and Canada based companies, but obviously we would like to evolve that um, as, as we grow and, and knowing that there's different regional challenges and policies and regulations around food waste and the management of that. I think getting international feedback on that would be very helpful. So I can include that link uh, in the chat or in a follow up email. Um, so you guys can check that out. It's open right now for comment until um, December 4th, I believe. So we've still got it for a few more weeks. So just sharing that with your networks or taking a look at it, even if you're curious, would be really, really beneficial. Um, and in general, I know Tessa already left, but she sent me a couple of recommendations for companies I didn't know of um, and would love to reach out to. So even if you know of people or, or organizations that are upcycling, interested in upcycling, definitely connecting us to, to them would be really helpful. Um, we can't know about everybody, unfortunately, so it's, it's always helpful to have people, you know, connecting and helping us build that network a little bit more. So I think a lot of the focus is just growing that international presence and, um, you know, for us too with consumers wanting to make sure that they know what upcycled food is so that when they start seeing it in the stores, they can, you know, want to buy it, know what it is. Um, so we're doing a lot of consumer awareness on social media. Um, I would be happy to talk about maybe some social media collaborations with people as well. Maybe it's an Instagram live chat, something along those lines. Um, so we can cross promote each other. Um, so yeah, so a lot of it's focused on that sort of international growth, which is why I'm excited to be on this call with such a, um, you know, such a large group of people from different places. So yeah, so I don't know if I need any answers right now but I do think you know just some help in keeping that in mind going forward and I'll send the, the link to the certification right now while I'm thinking about it um, yeah so if anybody has any comments on that right now you're welcome to share but otherwise I'll just share this information here so um, thank you very much um, Rochelle thank you all um, the topic food waste um, right now I have my parents over and we are having dinner and dinner so <laughs> I should get going. Um, it was very nice and I hope that we will 
make some great bonds and yeah hope we will see more of you rochelle and the rest thank you very much thank you have a good one bye bye yeah, I think it's usually like something like all of you and your presentations have told about, which is about like some community uh, aspects and to share like uh, to share recipes, to share knowledge, to share also informations uh, about methodology. And we like for, for now, I don't I can't I don't remember the name, but the, I heard about one or two companies that were actually also doing some upcycled food. So I would like send them to you to you afterwards. But yeah, it's really uh, yeah important I think for everyone just yeah to try to help the 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 other one because even like it's we're all fighting for uh, the for the for the same cause and try to reduce food waste and the impact that it can have and yeah as Jean Claude said too it, like the problem but also the good thing with food waste is like it have like a serious impact on the environment but also have some social consequences and by uh, yeah taking this food and to give it to people in needs and the other way in the other way around for the one who have some extra foods to uh, or some ways to upcycle and uh, upcycle them it's uh, yeah it's there's like a lot of uh, things and many projects just over across each other's and it's really important here yeah, to pass uh, information and try to to engage on these topics um, uh, Jean Claude, do you have any specific in mind you would like also to to tell us about, or any problematics you're facing right now? Um, in fact, the the business model we have created to expand our uh, association in France is based on the um, uh, on the, the the rate, the percentage the government is giving to. Um, uh, to associate to non-profit association uh, recognize of uh, general interest like we are uh, to uh, give a second life to food waste in the in the trades I told you at the beginning 60% of their value of the value of this of this food and uh, uh, nowadays we are very much concentrated on France of course we are a small association we are only 200 volunteers, mainly in Paris and Paris region. We have only six uh, people paid by the, by the association. So, uh, but um, in order to, ex to expand, uh, we will consider maybe to expand to Belgium, for example, at the beginning. But uh, what is important for us is the law and the, the, the situation that the government in each country is giving to uh, these uh, uh, donations because we can survive and we can expand and we can have a, a, a competitive uh, uh, advantage vis-a-vis -vis the startups because we are not a startup, we have an association. Only if, like in France, the, the government uh, is giving um, um, is giving a high uh, level, uh, a high rate of uh, uh, valorization of this uh, food. And so just to mention that for us, uh, what is very important is the decision of the government. Because if the government, uh, like in, in Belgium, for example, it's not 60%, but more 40%, like in Germany, it's more 30%, etc. If the government doesn't give a push to associations, non-profit, of course, it would be difficult to compete with uh, startups uh, like uh, I said, like uh, Too Good To Go, for example, because we are uh, on the same market, I would say, uh, in France. Um, so let's keep in mind that uh, the decisions of the governments are very important um, to create a, 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 a positive uh, playing field on this. Do you guys who does not live in France has any idea about how are the regulation on that topics? Because like, yeah, I also live in France, so I don't, I don't know uh, for the for foreigners countries, or maybe you also maybe know someone who might have this knowledge. Do, do you have, yeah, do you know anyone who could help them with? Doesn't look so. 
it's like a really specific problem also. No, it's a specific problem, but don't worry, uh, Thomas. We we have the uh, we can also find on internet uh, this mm. uh, because it's of course it's uh, it's public of course because it's coming from the government. So uh, no, I just wanted to I, I didn't want to say that we we are we have a problem to know mm -hmm. the rates etc. Just to say that the way the government is intervening in each country is very important if we go through um, uh, a push towards uh, people in need or just towards um, uh, uh, to, to save food from food waste. That's it. And uh, of course, associations like us in France, we are pushing the government to consider to make a difference and to to make a, a positive difference vis-à-vis uh, -vis associations because the uh, food insecurity is so high. Uh, in, in Paris, uh, Thomas, you know that probably, you are living in Paris? Par uh, uh, nearby. In the, nearby, in okay. The... In Paris, uh, people are eating in, uh, in beans. I mean, in everywhere. I mean, it's just incredible situation. Especially in these times where it's, yeah. Exactly, exactly. And so it's dire t times, yeah. Mm. yeah. Well, Sebastian, you know that also. <laughs> um, Daniel, uh, oh yeah, so first of all, hello. Um, and Irene, do you have, uh, do you want to, yeah, to say uh, anything about like this topic? Do you have any questions or any, any remarks regarding, uh, regarding that? Yeah, so at our university, we are starting now a project with uh, uh, many researchers to uh, move to more sustainable food systems. Um, uh, it's going to be focused for um, mainly on like a plant-based uh, diet, uh, uh, food waste and um, um, how do you say um, organic meat so meat that is um, actually uh, treat the animals a bit better let's say um, with the food waste we are trying to implement some tricks that we uh, collected in these years for example our canteen now um, does not produce the food a um, few hours before like sandwiches and then wait for the students to come, but it's more on request. Uh, so it actually um, takes a bit more money and a bit more time, but at least uh, we produce only the, uh, the sandwiches and the food that are actually gonna be eaten. Um, we have a big problem though, that is about um, leftovers when we people have meetings. Uh, not uh, usually people don't finish their lunch, but uh, because of some regulation, we are not allowed to bring it to, um, for example, charity associations. Um, so we don't know what to do. What we try to do sometimes is just to call the students nearby and ask if they want a sandwich. Um, but yeah, we kind of need to talk also with other university to know how it's possible to overcome this problem. Yeah, I think it's some probably like a recurring problem that's yeah, like from food from the shops and even more from food from the canteen that there's some leftovers and being allowed like through the legislation to be allowed to reuse that one. I think it's like a really complicated problem, yeah. especially in this time of like health oh, yeah. um, problems. It's yeah, yeah. It's yeah. Now we don't have this problem mainly because the canteens are closed. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, we had this problem even before the COVID. Uh, so we would be happy to use app like uh, uh, Too Good to Go or another app that was presented today. But uh, yeah, indeed, legally we can't. So if someone of you knows some, I don't know, some tricks or something, just yeah, let me know. Jean-Claude, maybe you're the most... Uh, well, the, the answer is very simple. You have to convince your government to change the law. This is exactly, this is exactly what we did in France. We changed the law uh, with uh, uh, the law EGALIM. Uh, Thomas, you know it, uh, Etat Généraux de l'Alimentation. Uh, and so there is a new law now, which yeah. uh, imposes to... Uh, so this law uh, is now uh, 11 months uh, old only. Mm -hmm. uh, 
propose now for all the canteen, the events, etc., to have a solution not to waste food. And yeah. it's, it's imposed by the government in France, and it's very good, sorry to say that, but you have to lobby your government to do the same. Okay, well, technically, I'm not even Dutch, but <laughs> I'll try. <laughs> well, whatever, but... Uh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, like one thing that could also help, I think Tessa said that they've uh, like developed concrete um, yeah, ways how they have to transport or store the food so that they can give it to to people again. Maybe she could mm -hmm. help on that as well. Okay. But she's already left. Oh, yeah. yeah, thank you very much for your suggestions. I just want to add that when you have a, a legislation from the state, then on the ground, the, um, uh, uh, the stakeholders are creating associations or structures in order to uh, develop things to tackle this problem. For example, in France, we have an association, uh, it's called Le Chénon Manquant. Thomas, maybe you know it. Uh, <laughs> It's uh, an association which is tackling only that uh, ah. food wasted by events or canteen or, or etc. Uh, le chénon manquant in in English would be uh, the um, uh, link, uh, the missing link, the missing link, le chénon yeah. manquant. Uh, go to the website. Maybe it's in French. So I, I don't know. Maybe they are. I think they are operating only in France, but they are very powerful. And they are doing a, a fantastic job. Uh, I know them uh, for for poor people because all this food is going to poor people. Oh, nice. And uh, if you change the law, then after that, uh, with the new situation, the uh, stakeholders on the ground are developing things, uh, very creative. Uh, and I said that there is no link with what I'm doing myself. Huh? So it's other association, but yeah. uh, yes. Thank but you very first, much. First, change the law. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, not you, but your politician. <laughs> yeah, but I'm pretty sure that uh, it's also it may it might also exist somewhere in Netherlands some um, similar association or like movement of groups that is already trying to pushing to uh, modify the those regulations because yeah it's sometimes super stupid to see all the like yeah the amount of food wasted um, but i assume i you might already have yeah had a look at it but yeah we have a network of uh, universities and sustainable departments so i'll probably ask to the dutch people if there is an association like this thank you um all right um so uh, does someone have something else to say because it's already like yeah, uh, well, almost one hour and a half we've been talking. Um, I, I have to go, Thomas. Excuse me, I have another meeting now. I have yeah. to go. So <laughs> yeah, okay, sure. bye bye to everyone. Bye bye. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Bye. Um, yeah, so if we if we are all fine with that, maybe we are thinking we could uh, end up uh, now. Um, as I said, I will so first of all uh, send a follow-up email with a, a short summary of what we've been saying. Uh, I will send you also the link to the group chat discussion on Climate Connect. So we've recently implemented the, the chat messages. So we try to um, make our community use them more because um, now for now they usually like post some projects and does not create enough inter interactions so I think uh, going through such events and then try to formulate some actions and some leads and try to create some groups so we can help each other can really be helpful in, um, in the global community so um, I, will, I will do that and let you know about it um, is there any feedbacks you want to do, any remarks or anything else you, you would like to, to talk about or are you, are you fine? I just want to say thank you for bringing us together. It was, a, it was a good conversation and, you know, I'm used to talking just to upcyclers. So it's nice sometimes to remember there's so many other people and organizations doing work out there. So it was nice to connect with all of you. <laughs> yeah, please share. All right, so yeah, if you're all fine with that, we can we can edit now.
thank you again all for participating. As just Rochelle said, it's always like, yeah, uh, motivating to see that there's some people acting all around the world, that we face some same issues, but some in some countries it was moving forward, so it can expire, it, it can be inspiring for, for the other one, and we we try to all keep in touch just to, to see how everyone's going and try to provide some um, local uh, solutions and help each other so all our projects can, can grow. All right. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, you a lot, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Ciao. Ciao. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.